Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. Thank you for joining our Transform 365 podcast, a discipleship and teaching ministry of SWCC. We pray this teaching helps you to grow in your journey with Christ. We have some great resources available for you on Transform365.com webpage. Feel free to download discipleship materials, small group teaching, as well as peruse our training workshops. Also take time to visit www.swcc.org for videos, teaching, and more. We thank you for listening and your support, and we would love to hear from you. So use our contact page and drop us a line. Now, for our podcast teaching. Hello and welcome to the Transform 365 podcast. I'm Pastor Cody and this is Pastor John. We're uh, committed to teaching the Bible clearly um, in order to help people grow and reach others in Christ. Uh, Today we're joined by a special guest, Dr. Charlie Bing. Charlie is always a great individual to talk to, a personal friend. Dr. Bing, thank you for joining us today. Um, If you uh, wouldn't mind, uh, just give us a little bit about yourself for those that don't know you and a little bit about your ministry, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Well, thank you for having me on and uh, good to talk to you and John again. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in Maryland, uh, born in Washington, D.C., grew up in Maryland and lived there. Uh, I went to Bible college there and married there. And then uh, my wife, Karen, and I came to Texas to pursue more education at Dallas Theological Seminary, where I got a THM and stayed for a a PhD degree. While, and meanwhile, during a PhD degree, we start having children. I'll get that out of the way. (laughs) We have four four grown children. We just found out we're expecting our 11th grandchild. Oh, Oh, congratulations. They're all married. Um, Children are married. And um, anyway, so back to uh, uh, while I was getting my doctoral degree, I started a church. I was, I've was i been in church ministry for 25 years, started a church in uh, a suburb of uh, Fort Worth. We call Burleson Bible Church. And I told them I'd stay there for three years. It ended up being 19 years and uh, things were going really great. So I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I stepped down to do what I'm doing now, which is Grace Life Ministries. And we uh, share the gospel of grace with unbelievers and the grace of the gospel with believers all around the world by writing, by preaching and producing resources in our own podcast. So that's fantastic. And you do have a fantastic website and we encourage everyone to go ahead and peruse that website and be familiar with it. You have some amazing resources, right. tracks, papers, articles, your books are available there. That's grace life ministries dot org or com i forget actually it's just gracelife.org gracelife.org okay. yeah so uh dr being you're very active as you mentioned you planted a church in burleson texas uh you helped start the free grace alliance help one of the co-founders you you teach uh at a myriad of different schools you do the uh schaefer school of theology grace school of theology along with uh, seminary uh, seminars and teaching uh, i've seen you take trips to the philippines the ukraine um, various areas in Europe and Europe um, and Africa. You're a prolific writer of devotions and articles and books, uh, Fishing for Life Simply by Grace, Grace Salvation and Discipleship, Lordship Salvation, 21 twef- Tough Questions. Wow, I'm getting tongue-tied here. <laughs> uh, just to name a few. Um, we personally, as, a, as, as our um, school ministry, w- one of the things John and I have done, and it's been such a blessing for us, is right now we're taking our middle school through uh, grace, salvation, and discipleship, and wow. we're using it uh, to formulate questions and and just uh, kind of help the kids see the difference between salvation and discipleship. Kind of building up to that that area, why do you see having a clear definition of salvation apart from works? Because that seems to be one of the most uh, important areas that you write on. Why do you think that's such an important area to teach and speak and write upon? Well, I don't, I mean, you have to ask the question, but the answer is so (laughs) simple. It's because when the gospel is clear, more people will get saved. And we live in a world today 
where the gospel is is just muddled everywhere you go mm. and 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 it really goes back to people's understanding or misunderstanding of what grace is and what the bible has to say about that so um i you know i'm an evangelist at heart i'm not a I don't call myself a theologian, although I have theological degrees. I can do research. I can keep up. Uh, I my heart is uh, to share the gospel, so I call myself a not a evangelistic theologian, but a theological evangelist. Mm. If you get the difference, yeah. And my burden is to do because evangelists have not had a good reputation for sharing a clear gospel. My burden is to help people share a clear gospel, not just evangelists, but pastors and everyone. Yeah, which is a major part of your ministry currently is you go around um, just helping pastors see the clarity of of the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Dr. Bing, um, I just want to thank you for your website, your website. So like Cody said a little while ago, how um, what a blessing to have a website like that where we could just look up any like all the articles and especially the, um, the grace notes, which I use during the class with the kids here at the school. And I just want to say thank you. I'm on your website almost every day. Just and he give, he gives you credit. He doesn't pirate them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Hey, type I, I, you know, I use them. That's what they're there them. for. Exactly. But I got a question. Uh, how important is because you know we are doing um, your book here, Grace, Salvation, Discipleship. Give us um, why is it important for to to differentiate salvation and discipleship? Yeah. Well, you know, in the book, I use that model of. Um, a truth and B truth, a yeah. truth relating to eternal salvation, the uh, scriptures are returning relating to eternal salvation. And B truth is the scriptures relating to discipleship or Christian life, mm -hmm. Christian growth. And it's very important to make that distinction. In fact, Dr. Ryrie uh, says, and I say, I use on the quote on the back of the book, and I'll paraphrase, he says, the difference, understanding the difference between salvation and discipleship is one of the most important distinctions, or maybe the most important distinction you can make in your Bible interpretation because if you take the conditions for discipleship, which are many and involve our commitment and our works, hating our father, mother, brother, sister, denying ourselves, taking up a cross and all these things that Jesus said, make a disciple and you make those conditions for salvation. Well, what have you done? You've compromised the gospel of grace. It's no longer free. It's conditioned on what we do, the commitments we make or the promises we make and and you steal the possibility, uh, really steal any actual possibility for people to have assurance of salvation, mm. because nobody can be absolutely sure that they've done all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, on, the only gospel that can, by which we can say, I know that I'm saved, is the gospel of grace where we're trusting in what Jesus has done, everything that he's done. Nothing that we can do except to believe what he has done for us and to place our faith in him uh, for that promise of eternal life. Well, um, let me let me ask you, how did you come about the idea, you know, kind of keeping that same topic uh, of the grace, salvation, and discipleship and the A truth, B truth? How did that idea come about, if you don't mind us asking the idea of the A truth, B truth and just explaining it in that format? Uh, of course, I've always had to explain the difference between justification and sanctification, which mm -hmm. is what we're talking about here. I've had to do that since uh, since really beginning to write about it under the topic of Lordship Salvation, because I think that's where those two issues get confused. But the more I developed it and thought about it, the more differences I could see. And then uh, I heard uh, Dr. David Anderson one time give a message where he called salvation truth a truth and discipleship truth be truth so i started using that model because it was very easy for people to remember i used it overseas teaching pastors in america and when people heard that it's very simple a truth b truth model they said oh well, i get it now and yeah. so i decided to write a book uh based on that as a way of explaining the difference between salvation and discipleship and uh it's a very easy way for people to remember and grasp the concept uh, I mean, they could grasp justification versus sanctification, but why not simplify it in a, in a way that's very teachable, very memorable, A truth, B truth. Yeah, yeah. Put it in its uh, most layman terms, simplest terms that we can. Yeah. Um, Dr. Bean, when it comes to uh, free grace, I heard you one time, um, I don't know if it was a podcast or you were 
discussion. It was a, a panel where the phrase, um, some said that they don't use the, the phrase free grace anymore. They just like to say grace theology or something like that. Um, do you, you know, what, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Cause there, you know, if we say free grace, are you talking about the free grace of Schaefer? Are you talking about the free grace of GS? Are you talking the free grace of free grace Alliance or, you know, you know what I mean? How would, how would you, um, well, when I use the term free grace, I'm talking about the free grace of the Bible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? You know how people yeah, like to break them well, up. The, different, you know, what kind of I think those are Paul and I have mom from <laughs> exactly. kind of situation. I think those particular uh, the people that in groups that you just named would really have the same definition of free grace as I would. Grace that is totally uh, unconditional, undeserved, um, and does not involve any of our works at all. Um, it's a shame that we have to even use the term free grace, but in any theological debate, definitions are essential. And we find that in the Christian world, in the evangelical world, people don't define grace the same way. Mm -hmm. Some don't even bother to define it. They just assume that we know what it means. And, and I have found by experience, I know that you cannot take for granted that people understand what the word means. And, you know, when I go overseas and I teach Overseas, I don't use the word free grace. I don't use that terminology. I just teach them what grace is. Mm -hmm. And 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 we use the term free grace because in America, we're involved in these uh, disputes and theological debates. Yeah. And so, whereas at one time, it used to be enough to talk about the word of God and everybody knew what that meant. Now we have to say the inerrant word of God or the inspired inerrant word of God or the verbally inspired <laughs> We have to keep adding the adjectives uh, in the theological discussion. So free grace is actually a biblical term. We're saved freely by his grace, Romans 3.24. There's an emphasis there on the word uh, free, um, and it, which was unnecessary because grace is free. So it, it's, it is biblical, and it's just necessary when we're talking to people who might have a different view of grace. Dr. Bing, in, on page three of your Salvation Discipleship and, and page four, um, you give a great definition of discipleship. And I'm going to go ahead and read that, um, and, and then I'll, I'll tie that into a question here. It says, a Christian is someone who believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who died for our sins, rose again, and guarantees eternal salvation. So that's the definition of a, a Christian. Now you write in page four, a believer, um, excuse me, a, a disciple, a disciple is someone committed to following Jesus Christ and learning from him. Um, so that's what you write as the difference between uh, a Christian and a disciple. Why do you think it's important to know the difference and have a distinction uh, between the two when, when you're uh, teaching individuals? Uh, to really just kind of say, okay, there's a Christian or a believer, and now you have this growth aspect, which is discipleship. Yeah. Well, of course, there's the theological importance of it, which, which we kind of just discussed, but there's, very, there's a very practical side to it also, because many people think that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they've got their ticket to heaven, and that's all that's expected or required of them. And they don't understand that Jesus challenged people to live a life of committed discipleship when he said, follow me, come after me and gave conditions for discipleship. So there is more and there is reward for those who choose to obey him and commit their lives to him as disciples. So the very practical side of it is that we are challenged to continue to grow and not only be disciples, but to make disciples. And we can't make disciples if we're not disciples. We can't be disciples if we're not Christians working backwards. So uh, it's very important to have that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think people would be very surprised as they really start reading scripture a little bit more in depth for themselves to find that, uh, you know, the Bible mentions John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, and it mentions the Pharisees' disciples. And so there's three groups of disciples mentioned in scripture. And so really at its, at its, simplest you know that we know the pharisees not all of them believed in christ really the one in particular that is mentioned is nicodemus 
Um, and not all of John the Baptist's uh, followers believed in Jesus. So you got to kind of separate this idea of um, that everybody that believes falls into the disciple camp or that not everybody's following. So not all believers are following Christ mm-hmm. in the way that they should, although every um, everybody that follows Christ is a believer. Um, I asked Dr. Dill the same question I'm about to ask you, Dr. Bing, about how did you come up, um, you know, how did you know about free grace theology through books, you know, who influenced you in free grace theology? Okay. Well, let's just back up a little bit and ask, ask the question differently. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're doing the interview. <laughs> How did I come to understand the condition for salvation? Because back when I was saved, nobody was talking about free grace theology. Right, right. So uh, I think the person that explained the gospel to me explained it clearly. Uh, and I believed it when I was 19 years old. I went to Bible college where it was taught fairly clearly, but sometimes I would see some inconsistencies. I would listen to preachers on the, on the radio uh, mostly and, uh, and learn a lot from them, but sometimes I would hear inconsistencies. So over a process of time and constant, diligent Bible study, Mm. I began to work things out and understand that, that grace is absolutely free that works have nothing to do with our eternal salvation, but they are an essential part of our Christian life and we're accountable and responsible. Uh, And then, uh, then the debate started to develop in the Christian world about things like Lordship salvation. And pretty soon we have a term called free grace theology. Actually the term was used way back in the 1630s in a, a trial in Massachusetts Mm. Uh, which is very, very interesting. It was called a free grace controversy back there, Mm -hmm. but really nobody used the term much. So I just, I had no turning point in my life where I came to an understanding of free grace theology. It was just constant Bible study and refining my beliefs to make them consistent. And and the view that answers the most questions and has the less problems is is the right answer. And, uh, And what we call free grace theology did that for me. And so I began using the term, I guess, when uh, 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 maybe it was probably uh, Charles Ryrie or Zane Hodges way back when started using it. And so there's no there's no turning point. It's just it's just develop a constant studying of scripture and letting the scripture lead you. Yeah, it was a a constant development in your life. Yeah. Dr. Dillow said something about um, what he said. Gospel under siege was the book. Like you said, he he obviously he studied the the scriptures, but the, the the books confirmed what he was studying. And I think he said the gospel under siege was the one that really, you know, was well, the game was, the, was echo, the game changer for him. I can echo him on that because that you know while we are de- well like he and I were developing in our minds. I didn't know him back then. He's a good friend now. When we were developing the art theology in our minds, we find a book where somebody puts together. Yeah you know, what free grace theology is and how to interpret passages um, in their context. And we, and a lot of us just said, wow, this is it. So that was an influential book for me also. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I think somebody should eventually do a history on this because it's so neat. It seems like while Ryrie and Hodges and, you know, like guys like Pentecost Leitner and them were kind of coming into their own, I guess you would say understanding of free grace at the same time, guys that had respected and were reading some of their works here in Florida at Florida Bible College, like Ray Stanford and them, they were dev- they were coming to those same understandings at you know kind of like at the same time, same moment as the other group, and uh, it really created a um, a movement really when it came down to it in in the uh, late seventies mm. and and eighties to the nine and early part of the 90s, I guess you'd say, uh, for the most part, when it came to uh, the understanding of free grace theology. And what I found is that there are other groups out there that had this, have the same free grace theology, but never really crossed lines with some of these groups. Yeah. Like yeah. A group in Minnesota, a group in Maryland I know about, and then there was the Florida Bible College group, and um, there, there are other enclaves. Yeah. It, it seemed like it, it, there was like this uh, wave of, you know, I guess to steal the term enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks to me like people have been studying the Bible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> people are reading it for what it's worth. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, sometimes when theologians and pastors uh, take a stand on the gospel um, free of works, they get labeled as antinomian, um, meaning without law, or as uh, the, the latest term right now going around is no lordship. But that's not the case in reading your books. Uh, you read, uh, you know, as we've talked about the um, grace, salvation, discipleship, uh, you're simply by grace. I think it serves as like a, a grace primer, but it encourages people to continue in their growth and, and walk towards Christ. Um, but in, in your books, you're, you're constantly kind of aiming people towards the character and walk. Uh, can you explain how Jesus's lordship and our responsibility fit together in uh, a believer's walk under grace? I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's look at it this way. When we talk about Jesus's lordship, there's two aspects to it. There's the objective aspect to it. Jesus is Lord. Yes. He is God mm-hmm. of all. He is the Lord God. And that's the primary meaning of Lord. Uh, and how it is translated uh, uh, over 6,000 times in the Septuagint, for example, by the word kurios for Lord in the New Testament. And Jesus was called Lord, I think, over 740 times in the New Testament uh, with the understanding that sometimes it was used as a title and a title of respect, of course, that he deserved. But yeah. sometimes disciples would sometimes use that of rabbis. You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It was it was like saying "Senor" in the yeah. Spanish language. Yeah. My understanding is, John, you can correct me on this. <laughs> no, you're right. "Senor" is like saying "Mister," uh, yeah. right? But it is also means "Lord" in the Spanish language. The word "curios" could be a title of respect, you know, like uh, "Lord So and So," or it could be a declaration of his deity. Um, in fact, in Acts sixteen thirty, when the jailer in the incident with the jailer and um, Paul and Silas, the, in the after the earthquake, the jailer addresses Paul and Silas as lords. He says, mm. curioi, right. plural. He says, lords, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't saying, you're my masters. In fact, he was the master of them. Mm-hmm. He was simply saying, sirs, what must I do to say, be saved? And then they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And they were pointing, I think, to his deity there. Uh, so there's an objective view, and that's why I get a little bit irritated by those who call our view the no lordship view. It, it, it's, it's really an unnecessary pejorative connotation they want to evoke. Of course, we believe Jesus is Lord. Mm. Uh, he's the God of all. Now, the second aspect to lordship would be the subjective aspect, uh, and that is, is he the master of my life? Is he the Lord of my life? And that depends on my response to him. He's Lord, whether I make him master or not, Mm -hmm. in the sense that we have a president of the United States who is your president, whether you like his politics or not, or whether you follow his politics or not, he's your president. You can subject your, you have to subject yourself to him technically as a citizen, but you don't, but many people don't. Uh, So we have a subjective response. Uh, and I, I totally believe in lordship sanctification, where we're to follow Jesus and obey him as Lord. And that's where we make the difference. But when we talk about his lordship and salvation, he couldn't be savior except for the fact that he is the Lord God. Mm-hmm. And because he's a deity, he could die for the whole world. And he could he could become flesh and he could die for, uh, I'm sorry, he could become flesh and he could die for the whole world. As a human, he could die. Yeah. And so... Yeah. He had to be the Lord God in order to provide salvation for the whole world. And then, uh, and now that he, we know him as savior, it's just a natural, it should be a natural response of grace and gratitude and love to uh, want to make him a part of our life. In fact, make him the Lord or master of our lives. Yeah. I think, I think out of response for uh, just the respect and growth that we're having, uh, kind of the natural response is, Lord, I, I, I've messed up my life enough on my own. I'm, I'm handing it over to you. You can be master and Lord of it. You know, as you said, he's Lord over, over the world, whether we want him to be or not. Uh, that is who he is. So, All right. And let, just let me say that the, his master, him, his role as master is part of his role as deity. But Lord, 
evokes or denotes deity before it denotes anything else. And deity includes a lot of things, a lot of things like high, his high priesthood, his kingship, his, he's the redeemer, he's the creator, and he's our master. So it's arbitrary just to say uh, that we have to make him master of our life and use the word Lord to say that. Yeah, I, I like to try to explain it um, using the idea of uh, the Queen of England. You know, uh, she's she's uh, the monarch. She's the head. She's the 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 Lord of the the land. Really, um, whether the people really uh, respect that or not, she still is. Um, and 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 I think in our society, as, as in the West, I guess you'd say, um, in, as a, as Americans, uh, we kind of don't catch that. You know, it it it's a little bit uh, foreign to us to understand that somebody could be your majesty and not uh, demanded respect that goes with it. And the Lord does not do that to us. He does not demand uh, that with a cliffhanger with it. Like you have to uh, give me uh, your life or else it's, it's, he knows he's Lord. He's not going to demand it because his, he, he, it's, it is him. It is built in him. It is, you know, part of it, whether we choose to accept it or not, because, in the end, as Revelations lets us know, every knee will bow before him. And, you know, I was just thinking of that yeah. verse, yeah. Um, there will be a day when everyone acknowledges yeah. and is forced to acknowledge and submit to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but some for some, it'll be too late for salvation. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you as a follow-up to that, why do you feel it's important in sharing the gospel to steer clear of words like make Jesus Lord of your life. Well, because we can't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. (laughs) But when they say make Jesus Lord, they are meaning make him master of your life. And the reason I don't use that, you know, there was a time when I was a new Christian, I used that kind of language, Uh, but this is my process of getting weaned away from that to a clearer gospel. When you use that kind of language, you're telling people that they have to submit everything in their life to Jesus Christ. Now, an unbeliever doesn't know what Jesus even demands of their life. So it's very confusing to them. And uh, and they, they need to know what Jesus would demand of them before they could do that. And then, as I said, uh, they can never be sure that they've really done it. And it's corrupted the gospel by adding works. When you add works to the gospel, you steal a person's ability to be sure they're saved. Hmm. Um, so it, it's, it's a very confusing message. And those who actually preach that are inconsistent themselves. I don't know that anybody that preaches that kind of what we call a lordship gospel who lives up to it 100%. So it's a bit hypocritical. Yeah, it's... Uh... I think it's a, an impossibility to hand over to the Lord every aspect of your life. Um, if, if we're being honest. <laughs> I do it every morning, but I, I'm not sure that I cover all the bases. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing. That's a Christian. That's a discipleship decision. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it doesn't come until Romans 12, you know? Yeah. It doesn't come until after we understand his grace in Romans 1 through 11. Then in chapter 12, uh, we should offer our bodies a living sacrifice. Exactly. Exactly. One of my, uh, one of our favorite questions to ask is, um, you know, and John hit it a little bit early on is um, what, what set you on your theological journey? And now you've, you've given a little bit of a background of how that, um, you know, you, you came to an understanding of, of free grace theology, but what are some of the top influences in your life, books, teachers, writers that um, have really kind of come alongside you in helping you develop that? Yeah, um, I had some good teachers. Uh, some of them were from Dallas Theological Seminary, which is why I wanted to go there. And, uh, you know, you got a pretty clear gospel from them. It wasn't always consistent. Uh, and so I could name a lot of, you know, my Bible college teachers, my pastor, um, but when I got to the seminary and started to sort things out, I found uh, that I was uh, greatly influenced by uh, one professor, um, Zane Hodges, um, and uh, he seemed to have a very clear gospel and could explain some of the difficult verses. 
Um, now, since I first knew him, Zayn Ha just changed some of the views and I, I, I was not able to follow him on everything. But, you know, anybody that I can, I'm going to name, I don't follow on everything. Uh, Dr. Ryrie had a great influence. Uh, I differ with him on a couple of things. There's no teachers that will find that who agree on everything, even free grace the teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Pentecost was a very free grace oriented uh, uh, professor, and I gained a lot from him. And and from Dr. Toussaint, Dr. Stanley Toussaint. Now, Dr. Toussaint was against lordship salvation. He held a little. He held kind of onto the idea of perseverance and works being a proof of salvation. So I, I thought he was a little inconsistent there, but he was the most loving and gracious man you'd ever meet. And uh, I got very close to him in my doctoral work. If it, in fact, if it wasn't for him, my doctoral dissertation might not even have uh, been approved. It was on Lordship Salvation. Mm. He, he fought for me. Uh, so I've heard people criticize him and some of these others, but you know, nobody gets it. Even you and I, Cody, would disagree on some interpretations. Yeah. No, none of us agree on this. The, the main thing is the gospel free or are the conditions attached to it um, of what we have to do or promise to do. That's the main thing. So those were some influences. I read the gospel under siege was a great influence when it came out because it was one of the cutting edge books. You know, another great book I recommended that came out early was uh, Chuck Swindoll's book, uh, Grace Awakening. Mm, a lot of that's great, that's a good one, too. Yeah, it's, it's a great book to read. It's a lot of good things there. Um, so th- those were kind of the, the main books. And then then the book started to come forth in the debate and a lot of a lot of good articles and um, uh, were coming out and. And sorry, I started to piece together a lot of different things, but those are some of the main influences. Yeah, you brought up your uh, dissertation. Um, I still have uh, the white copy of of your <laughs> dissertation. <laughs> I got that at uh, one of the Grace uh, seminars up in uh, Chicago. I for, I forget the the area now. Uh, Toussaint, I, I thought I sent you a newer one. <laughs> We yeah, I, th- the- I think I do have the newer one, but that's still, you know, it's that's a prize. That's a prize commodity now. One of the originals. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Toussaint, you you brought up uh, Dr. Toussaint, and he, uh, you're you're right. He was just such a soft spoken man. I mean, I never got to meet him myself personally, but uh, I, I remember um, just going through anything and everything that I could find, even e- either written by him or on YouTube or, you know, whatever videos or, or what I could collect. And um, just a very sweet, soft-spoken man. But I would say a, a style word for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His work, I think, on the kingdom, um, even though I don't agree with every aspect, like you said, of, of the work, is just such a great collective thought mm-hmm. on, on uh, you know, the kingdom the kingdom come but you know, um, I, you know as gracious as he was and and as much as he wanted to take a verse like james 2 19 even the devils believe I, and he asked me this in my doctoral exams he said uh do you believe that there's a false faith and he used that verse and i and i explained my interpretation of the verse that it's not talking about belief in jesus christ it's talking about belief in monotheism and so forth and and he just was quiet <laughs> he didn't argue back <laughs> Uh, I think he really softened towards the free grace position more. Uh, t- I mean, a total free grace position. Yeah. More later in his ministry. Yeah. Yeah. He, he yeah. Uh, you could see that shaping, especially uh, if, if you watch the uh, later years of the DTS chapels that he was on, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, uh, Dr. Bing, it, it, I would love to, um, give a second to uh you know just again if if um if you could share your your website uh so people know where they can find your materials and contact you and um just see what you have available because you're you make yourself available you make yourself available through your writing um you've come and guest spoke here at the church before and through the Free Grace Alliance uh, meetings. And then also you came in and uh, did a, a precursor to that. And we were really appreciative of that. Um, and uh, if you could just go ahead and share your website one more time with everybody. It's Grace Life. That's one word. GraceLife.org. 
And there you will find a lot of resources. Our grace notes are free to download. They're, they're all short Bible studies, two-page Bible studies on usually topics of some controversy that have to do with the gospel or discipleship. Uh, and you're free to copy them, download them, distribute them. I think we have them in about, I don't know, six or seven languages. Now we're increasing that every day. Uh, German, Spanish, uh, Fili- some Filipino dialects. Um, I'm working, we're working on French. Um, I, I forget all the different translations. <laughs> uh, and, and some other things in other translations. Uh, the most downloaded things we find on our website are the Grace Notes and the uh, introductions, outlines, and introductions to the Old Testament, New Testament, every book of the Bible. Those are quite downloaded. We're finding a great, in, since we're translating more things in the Spanish, we're finding that the Spanish downloads are starting to uh, really almost equal the English downloads. So we're happy to, that we can that's make fantastic. things available to Spanish speaking people. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, let, let me ask you, our, uh, I guess this will be our final question for, for the podcast interview. And I thank you again for joining us. Um, you know, when you think of the free grace movement, I, um, one of the people that I, I tend to think of now, I, I might be wrong in this. I know everybody has a, a person that kind of sticks out in their mind. Like John, I know his is always Zane. He kind of goes back to Zane anytime he thinks of free grace, but my mind always goes to Dr. Ryrie. And, um, it, in that understanding of free grace theology, and I know that he didn't agree with maybe every aspect that it's at today, you know, and, and um, as we said, not every free grace guy agrees with a hundred percent, which is fine because we're, we're all developing. Right. And right. Uh, he's definitely got a, a clearer picture of it than uh, either of us right now, though. That's for sure. Cause he's in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. But um, let me, let me ask you, Dr. Ryrie was, I would say a um, just a leader in the forefront of dispensational uh, belief system. And uh, uh, how would you say free grace theology and uh, dispensationalism are linked? Because it seems like a lot of people that uh, go towards the system of dispensational belief, um, a lot of them, not all of them, see uh, the, the free grace uh, movement as well. They, they believe it. Yeah, and, and there is a link, and I think that's probably why I ended up free grace is because the teaching I came under was mostly dispensational. Although I read a lot of reform guys at the beginning and I'm millennial and so forth. But I, I think first of all, the main, uh, the main connection is the hermeneutic used. The way you get a dispensational theology is by a grammatical, literal interpretation. Uh, and the only way, and when we depart into uh, spiritualizing like the promises made to Israel and making Israel the church and things like this, it, it messes uh, prophecy up. It messes uh, the distinctions between law and grace up and, uh, and so forth. So there, we have to have an understanding that there, there are different ways that God has re, not changed the gospel, but expanded the gospel and explained the gospel in different periods of time. Um, and we can't confuse it with the law and we can't confuse the church with Israel or we get into all, all kinds of uh, problems. So I think dispensational dispensationalism sees the differences in the scriptures. Mm. Um, it it ad, uh, accurately, we might say, um, divides the scriptures and, and understands the difference between the Old Testament, New Testament, law and grace, the church in Israel and, uh, and so forth. Great. Thank so, you. If somebody consistent with their interpretation, I think they'll end up um, dispensational. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I've uh, when I've come across uh, just, you know, friends that uh, take a, 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 a more staunch reformed view and, and they start taking the stance that um, the church is Israel. Um, I ask them what tribe they're from. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll plug Grant Hawley's book, which does make a connection between the uh, free grace uh, theology and dispensationalism. I can't cite, recite the title exactly, but I endorsed it and read it. And it's a good book. Grant yeah. Hawley, who you and I know. 
Yes, definitely. Grant's a great guy. Well, well, uh, Dr. Bean, um, I guess I should give one follow-up question if you permit that to me. <laughs> so um, if somebody is reading their Bible based on the conversations that we're having today, you know, just the idea of, you know, we pit some various topics um, and they come across a hard passage, what would your recommendation be um, to getting a, the clearest understanding that they can uh, without trying to go to a commentator, a famous theologian today, because, you know, uh, people tend to come with their theological bias and their rose tinted glasses. What would your recommendation be to somebody just coming across a passage that it seems maybe it contradicts another area of scripture or just doesn't give the clearest understanding of, of what they're reading? Okay. Well, you're, you're, it depends kind of on your definition of somebody, because if you got a brand new Christian, they're going to be floating all over the place, trying to figure things out. If you have an older Christian who understands some basic Bible study methods, they're way, well on the way to getting an accurate interpretation. But it, it boils down to good Bible study method. And that's a course that, you know, we always have to take in school. And we take that at the very beginning and we teach it everywhere we go also. And but, you know, the main rule of basic Bible study and it's context, context, context. Uh, I think the Bible is the best commentary on itself. And if a person can understand the context, not just the, the context around the verse with like the paragraph or even the chapter, but who's the book written to? Mm -hmm. Is it written to believers or unbelievers? Is it written in the New Testament or Old Testament? So is it written under the law or is it written in our time of grace? Uh, so we have all these circles of contexts, and and usually a person can figure things out. I'm confident is why I wrote the book on grace, salvation, and discipleship, and didn't cite a bunch of authors and commentators. I wanted people to see that using the context, you can understand these difficult passages. The answer is there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Context, context, context. That's what we always stress here at uh, Southwest Community Church and through our ministries. Well, Dr. Bing, I, I appreciate your time. You've been really gracious and coming on and joining us. Um, all blessings to your, your family and to your ministry. And uh, just uh, thank you once again. And um, gracelife.org. Um, go ahead, look it up. Uh, Dr. Charlie Bing is um, amazing at just keeping the gospel free and um, just Make sure you stay tuned. Look at all the different things that he has available. He also has his podcast by the same name, Grace Life, and make sure you tune into that as well. Actually, Dr. The, podcast, the podcast is called Simply by Grace. Oh, Simply by Grace. I apologize Simply for that. That's right. Org. Yeah, that's the podcast. <laughs> but you can find it at our website. Yeah, Color Me Embarrassed. Yeah, Simply by Grace. That's right. Oh. Uh, so, hey, uh, uh, Cody, before you, you before you sign off, I I just want to say appreciate what you're doing there in Miami and what you're doing for the gospel with your writing and this podcast. So just keep up the good work and stay yeah. faithful. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thank you for joining the Transform Three Sixty Five podcast, a ministry dedicated to helping you grow in relationship to Christ. If you want to know more, find us at transform three sixty five dot com or on our church website, www.swcc.org, located in Miami, Florida. Until next time, remember, the only work in grace is to let grace work in you. God bless. Thank you for listening. For more resources, or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.